what I will do is uh, give you a very short uh, introduction to each of our four speakers uh, today. Uh, we're privileged to have a, a, a diversity of people with different experiences throughout Western Europe uh, and, and goes beyond. Uh, further bios or more information about who they are and what they've done in their lives you can find uh, in the uh, bios that are made available uh, through the link uh, that you were given. I'm going to give them an alphabetical order and then we will have each uh, give their pre initial presentation in the order, in the alphabetical order that I've uh, read the introduction and then hopefully we will have some time for question and discussion. Uh, so we'll go from there. Michael Bluma, schönen guten Morgen. Um, Michael studied religious studies and political sciences uh, in Tübingen, uh, Germany, where he earned a PhD in religion and brain research. Since uh, 2003, he has been working for the Baden-Württemberg uh, State Ministry. Since 2018, Michael has been the state government, uh, been with the state government of Baden-Württemberg's uh, commissioner against anti-Semitism, among other things. Julie Jones, uh, Julie is the founder of the charity, the Forb Foundation, and is currently working as the director of the all-party parliament uh, group. Julie is our prime example of alphabet soup. Uh, I won't go through those uh, acronyms, but uh, as I continue on, there are a number. Um, for, and that AAPG is for International Freedom of Religion or Belief, otherwise known as FORB, and the director of the APBG for International Law, Justice, and Accountability. She also has represented the Interfaith Council for Wales on the Interfaith Network for Devoted, uh, I'm sorry, Devolved Nations. You can all look up what devolved means uh, later. Uh, Evelina Ochob uh, is a lawyer, human rights advocate, and author. She is a program lawyer with the IBA's Human Rights Institute and co-founder of the Coalition for Genocide Response. Her work centers on genocide, focusing on the persecution of ethnic and religious minorities around the world. Uh, Evelina uh, authored the initiative and proposal to establish the UN International uh, Day commemorating the victim of acts of violence based on religion or belief on October. August 22nd. Uh, some of you may have heard her name yesterday during one of the breakout sessions relating to the Human Dignity Day, and unfortunately she wasn't able to be here, so it's great to have her on this panel. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, if that were a word, uh, Anna Susanna uh, Oliveira de Santos. Uh, bon dia. Um, Susanna is a native of Lisbon, Portugal, and a devoted mother of three boys. I thought that was the crucial aspect since we haven't talked a lot about what happens within freedom of religion and belief within families. And so I, I wanted to emphasize that. Um, uh, and possesses a diverse range of experiences. For the past six years, she has been a member of the Ode Velas uh, City Council, uh, overseeing ranges of crucial matters, including education and public schools, all of which are interrelated in my mind. We had this conversation the other day, housing, social welfare, and religious affairs. Uh, each of the panelists is indicated, will present in the order uh, I've introduced them, and they can come from the podium or stay in their seats. After the presentations, again, we hope we can open up for some questions. So, Michael. Yeah, dear friends, as uh, I don't know how uh, good you are accustomed to German uh, English, my speech is already on the blog. I have the science blog and uh, it's uh, there so you can read it, but I will try to do it nevertheless because uh, I want to thank you. Actually, this is the fourth invitation I got to this conference and uh, I, I didn't expect it to, that the people would be so resilient in inviting me. <laughs> Uh, the first time uh, I'd written a, a German book about your church, about the, the church of, the, uh, um, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but at that time, uh, due to family, uh, family obligations, I couldn't come. The second invitation was uh, reached me when I was in Iraq. Uh, my state, um, uh, I had the honor to, to lead the mission of my state to evacuate 1,100 Yazidi women and children uh, from uh, Iraq that had suffered uh, violence from Daesh, from the so-called Islamic State. I'm happy to see that we have a Kurdish friend uh, with us from Erbil, and so uh, you might want 
to speak with him about the atrocities of the so-called Islamic states we are doing. Among the women we were able to rescue was, for example, Nadia Murad, who later be, uh, got the Peace Nobel Prize. And yesterday, um, Scottish MP Brendan O'Hara spoke about uh, this issue. Um, I want to emphasize this because, for example, I, had to, uh, I testified in three court cases against members uh, of Daesh against uh, this terrorist group. And when people are asking whether I've, I'm fearful, then I say I didn't start to fear or to have fear in Iraq, so I won't do it in Europe. Um, the third uh, invitation I got uh, was when I was a uh, press uh, state commissioner against anti Semitism in the state of Baden Württemberg. We are a state of 11 million, a little like Portugal, a little. Yeah, a, 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 uh, above, uh, okay, uh, like Portugal, and uh, in the southwest of uh, Germany, uh, capital is Stuttgart, and uh, we have uh, border to Switzerland and France, and we were the first state to to uh, get a state commissioner against anti-Semitism. The Jewish communities of uh, recommended me for this office um, without asking me that in advance if I would like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they said maybe you would have said no, and actually it's a very tough job. I have to admit that I couldn't come in 2018. You have to imagine a Protestant married to a Muslim, uh, has, having helped the Yazidis, is, is now working with the Jews. So there's a lot of hate mails uh, we are receiving, and even my, some of you might get some. I'm uh, apologizing because uh, I've got a ardent group of trolls uh, um, to, who don't believe that religions can live together. And and that people can help each other out, and that you can even uh, be in love with a person from another religion. Uh, so, but it actually it works. And so, uh, as the invitation came for the fourth uh, time, I said, "Okay, this time I have to be here." And uh, I only realized that this will happen as I came to on Saturday, as uh, we reached uh, uh, Utah. Yeah, and today, dear friends, is the 3rd of October. It's the day of German reunification. That's very um, moving to me to speak there, especially as my co-delegate from Germany is a Buddhist nun. Uh, and I, I like that. It's, uh, you, you made that perfect in a conference on religious uh, uh, freedom and variety. Um, I'm so glad that we have the honor to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be together in this conference, Dr. Moon Suk Hyo. Uh, her religious name is here, Hugh Sunim. Yeah, hey, yeah. You. Hey, you, <laughs> Sunim, <laughs> a Buddhist nun from Germany. Um, and I like it that in this panel there are two, two women uh, with me speaking. You know, in Germany we had a female head of state. Uh, in some of the other states too, Great Britain, uh, for example, uh, in Portugal. No, not on, in the United yes. States. We are waiting for that to happen here too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but of course, what, what I'm talking about and what is my daily issue is not that, uh, not that colorful and light, it's dualism, it's the hate against uh, a group of people, dividing humanity into two groups and you say, the ones are my friends, they are the good ones, and the others, they are the enemies I have to destroy. Some of you who have been with us at the conference of the uh, Latter Day Science on Sunday might have seen as we uh, went away that there were people there uh, shouting, cursing the, the believers of the, the, the church, not about criticizing a special uh, theology or, or uh, individual people, but denouncing the group as a whole, wishing it to be destroyed. And that's what we call dualism. Uh, the uh, esteemed rabbi of uh, Great Britain, Jonathan Sachs, great rabbi, blessed be his memory, called that dualism. He said, he, this is the base of all kinds of hate. When you divide humanity in the good ones and the uh, bad ones you want to destroy. Anti-Semitism is a form of dualism, and it is especially hateful because Jews were the first uh, religion of the alphabet. And we are using that um, uh, in uh, all the world religions now. Um, it's, uh, every Torah has 304,805 alphabet letters, the Christian Bible, the Muslim Quran, the Book of Mormon, ac according to the tradition, was translated into alphabetic scripture and the like. And the first group to start that were the Jewish people. And so in all other forms of dualism, racism, sexism, anti-Masonism, anti-Mormonism, you name it, the group is attacked as being inferior. 
But in anti-Semitism, the people believe that Jews, they are above them, that they are more powerful, rich, that they control everything. And so anti-Semitism is especially dangerous. In Iraq, I've, I had to fight with anti-Semitism even among our allies, our Kurdish, Arabic, Turkish, uh, Turkmen allies, uh, although there are no Jewish communities left in Iraq. But anti-Semitism doesn't go away with the Jews. It's a problem of the anti-Semites. Bet uh, Scharf uh, spoke about the Holocaust, uh, because, uh, and rightly so, because we are celebrating 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but this would not have happened if not 100 years ago. In 90, 1923, Adolf Hitler uh, tried his first uh, overthrow of the German democracy, and as he was not stopped, he succeeded 10 years later, uh, from 90 years ago in 1933. So we have to see that the way to our cherished declaration on human rights and on human dignity um, has been covered in blood by a mass murderer from my uh, state, from Germany. So in, in a certain sense, I hope that we will fight together for the rule of law against any kind of dualism and anti-Semitism. Um, I managed to defeat Twitter X in Frankfurt in a, a, a case, and. Uh, I'm today traveling to Washington and speaking tomorrow with the uh, Anti-Defamation League because they are now under attack from Elon Musk, uh, as is George Soros and our others. Uh, and I can assure you from the perspective of German history, it's never a good idea if people who have much media power are singling out groups to attack uh, and uh, to, to yeah, defame. Uh, I see throughout Europe and in the United States that it is a duty of the conservatives and the religious people to preserve the rule of law. If they go against it, then anything, then any democracy is doomed. I firmly believe the liberals normally they are uh, pro-democracy and pro-rule of law, but if the conservatives fail to adhere to these values, then no democracy could survive. So I want to end my speech with a citation of your senator in Utah, Mitt Romney. He wrote on May on X, formerly called Twitter, now X, autocracy always ends badly. Russia brutalizes its neighbor. China commits genocides on its minorities. Iran executes hundreds and imprisons 20,000 political opponents. Thank God for our constitution. Therefore, I want to thank all of you for your attention at our shared struggle against all kinds of dualism and for the rule of law. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for Mikhail and what he said. And I also want to thank the panelists uh, for what they're about to say. Um, Susanna and Evelina. I work with Evelina a lot in Westminster and whatever she says um, is amazing. I gotta tell you, um, we were sat down before this panel started and we, M M Mikhail and I was talking about um, public speaking. And I was like, I cannot speak when I get nervous. So I was like, let me tell you all about the brain and this th thing that I do to not be nervous. So he just amused me and listened to me. And then as the moderator introduced him, who was a, a specialist on the brain, <laughs> I realized who I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. I want to thank ICLRS um, for this symposium and for the organizers, especially for Elizabeth Clark and Deborah Wright for all that they've done. ICLRS are one of the stakeholders on our APPG FORB, and we work with them. I've sat in uh, meetings uh, with Brett Schaafs. We can see what he can do on a scale like this in bringing people together. But I love the fact that he can then sit around the table and talk about the one. There aren't many organizations that can do this and also do the one. And so I'm thankful for all the ICLRS do. Um, I wanna speak about the acronym FOB and let you all into a little secret um, about this that only two people know in this room. 
The acronym FOB has been around a, a long time and represents different things. But when 9-11 happened, in the UK, Parliament got together and Baroness Berridge decided that she needed to start an APPG. And she spoke to the man who talked about human rights most, Jim Shannon, and said, we need to start an APPG and call it Freedom of Religion. And as they spoke, they said, oh, hold on. We can't really call it Freedom of Religion because what about the Buddhists? How do we represent those? Or what about the humanists? And how do we represent those? So they said, let's call it Freedom of Religion or Belief whatever your belief is. So in 9-11, we started FOB, Freedom of Religion or Belief. And that's where it came from. And I just want to thank Baroness Berridge and Jim Shannon for that. So what is an APPG? Well, it's an all-party parliamentary group. And that's what I love about the UK. Um, I, I work in a world of politics which is the least political thing that you come across. Which all parties put together their beliefs with their party, sit around a table and say, what are we gonna do for international law? What are we gonna do for the freedom of those? And they then become a voice for the voiceless. So what, do, what does an, um, the staff of an all-party parliamentary group do? Well, we work with the MPs, but they have to look after their constituents. They don't have time to do research. They don't have this knowledge that they can do. So we have to get NGOs. We have to get stakeholders or um, non-executive directors who can come and give us the research that we need we take that research and then we say, okay, the best thing to do is to hold a debate on this because this will be the outcome. Or we need to do a written question or we need to do um, an EDM or we need to do an urgent question. And we take it forward. And we also organize delegations to take countries that are breaking international law or that are allowing international law to be broken within the country and at a grassroots level, with the stakeholders, we go and find the evidence that we need so we can bring it back to hold our own government accountable and also other governments for what's happening. We also look at those who are being imprisoned and persecuted for their religion or their belief, whatever that belief is, and we try to help them be freed. I've had some of the experiences where I've seen our MP Jim Shannon and Brendan O'Hara or Fleur Anderson or our Deputy Special Envoy um, David Burroughs sit around tables with governments asking them for assistance uh, to help people be freed. And I'd like to thank them for the time and devotion that they give to this. But what is FOB to me? Well, I want to answer that with a question. If I was to ask you all to sit here today and just get out your phones or your paper and to write two sentences of what your belief means the most to you, what would you say? And then I'm going to ask you to repeat that. But then would you be willing to walk out of this symposium because of just the two sentences of your belief and then get arrested? Would you be willing to be raped or tortured or even know that from this symposium, you would never see your family again? That is freedom of religion. Now, I'm blessed because I live in a society where I'm 17% 17 of the world that doesn't have to ask myself that question. I've come to this symposium today because I know I'm not going to be arrested or persecuted, imprisoned or raped for what I am saying. But 83% of the world don't live like that. And I just feel that God has called all of us to pay a part play a part in his peace, whatever that part may be, 
in helping the lives of others, others, in helping religious freedom. And I'm just so grateful for it. I want to leave with just an example. I've seen what it's like to meet Leah, Sharab um, Leah Sharabu's mother, a 14-year-old girl that was ad abducted, and to look into her mother's eyes and see no spark. I know what it's like to meet Mubarak Bala's wife and the little child, knowing that they're never going to see him be freed again until he's 24, and to see her beg me for help. But the most thing that has got me the most about religious freedom was when we recently went to Pakistan. And we were trying to collate evidence to help those. And a Christian, I say a boy, he was in his 20s, we asked about religious freedom for Christians there. And we said, what is it like for women? And he said, I can tell you what it's like because my sister is missing. And he started sobbing. I was sat next to him. I was meant to be writing notes and I couldn't write a note because he said, I can give you personal witness because Christian women here don't go to school because of they'll get abducted. And I convinced my parents to send my sister to school. She was the only Christian girl and we now don't know where she is. And it's been two years. I saw and felt his guilt letting his sister go to school. And for me, a person who has all the blessings in life, I just hope that I can join with you as much as I can to play my tiny part in helping those without a voice to have something, in helping those that don't have my freedoms to have eventually one day what I have. And if that means I've got to spend the rest of my life doing it, then I will let my God know that I will spend the rest of my life helping him save more of my brothers and sisters. Thank you. It's uh, great to be back um, at BYU, not only because I absolutely love the chocolate-covered cinnamon bears, if you have not tried them, I definitely recommend. They are available from the store from, uh, for $6.99. <laughs> Inflation. Um, but uh, with all seriousness, um, it's wonderful to be here and to hear from many wonderful experts sharing their expertise and experience on working on religious persecution and uh, similar topics. And um, of course, this session is on Western Europe. And um, I work in Western Europe, um, but, but most of my work is about the situation of religious or belief groups outside of Western Europe. But nonetheless, I engage um, governments, politicians and governments in Western Europe, but not only, and also many international and regional institutions based in Western Europe. And I will be mentioning some of this work in my presentation. Most of my work um, is Research, 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 mapping atrocity crimes around the world, identifying early, identifying early warning signs, risk factors of atrocities to come, and identifying also um, avenues for justice and accountability in response to those atrocities. And in this work, I work mostly with politicians, including in the UK Parliament. Um, and Brendan O'Hara, who was here yesterday, he, um, I, I work with him very closely, especially on the situation of the Yazidis. And the situation of the Yazidis was already mentioned by Michelle, but also by, by Brendan yesterday. And, um, but also with Lord Alton of Liverpool, uh, Baroness Kennedy, and, uh, and many more. And that's only in the UK. And I also work with politicians in the Netherlands, but also in Poland and a uh, few other places. And in this work, I, I normally share the information, the data of the atrocities, identify some um, 
options and avenues that can be taken forward by politicians and governments. But um, ultimately, of course, um, there's a lot of pressure on, on politicians to actually follow up on those different steps. And I'm glad that um, we have also with us um, Jim Shannon MP, who is a wonderful uh, member of, 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 of the UK Parliament, who has been following up on every single situation that is brought to his attention. And he does not take a no for, us, uh, for an answer uh, from the government. And he, as you can imagine, there was, um, he, he hears the no many, many times, um, but he keeps going and that is much, much appreciated. And I'm glad that we'll be hearing from him later today. And I would like to share with you um, some of my work on genocide. And genocide will be the word that I will be repeating it again and again. I'm not paid for, for the word of genocide whenever I'm, I mention it, but um, it may appear so. Um, and I will be mentioning some of the work on the Yazidi genocide, but also on the Uyghur genocide, uh, Myanmar genocide, and a few situations where we talk also about genocidal atrocities. Um, but the religious element is not necessarily the most significant element of the atrocities. And for example, the ethnic atrocities are um, more um, significant among the atrocities visible there. And just starting with the Daesh atrocities against the Yazidis and other religious minorities. Of course, we are talking about atrocities uh, which began approximately in 2013, but um, the climax of the most severe atrocities as we witnessed them were in August 2014. And indeed, on the 3rd of August 2014, that's when Daesh attacked Sinjar and unleashed the genocidal atrocities, as we refer to them, uh, um, against the Yazidis. And then also attacked Nineveh Plains and uh, forced the displacement, uh, displacement of 120,000 of um, Christians living in Nineveh Plains, uh, predominantly pushing them to Kurdistan. And I remember um, visiting the UN in December 2015, that was already over a year after the atrocities. And there was a Yazidi man who came um, to talk about what's been happening to the Yazidis. And he said that the atrocities amount to the legal definition of genocide. And of course, um, originally I'm from Poland, so the word genocide is very, very um, serious one, and I don't take it lightly. Um, it has a um, legal definition. We cannot just use it to describe any situation around the world. We always have to look at the definition of genocide, which is in Article 2 of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And after hearing to him, I went back to my office and um, I started looking into whether we can actually recognize the atrocities as genocide. And at the time, there was not much um, on the topic, and it was not formally recognized by, by, by states or international um, actors. And I decided to do an analysis of the situation and, um, and prove the different elements of, of the crime of genocide. And around the same time, Lord Alton of Liverpool was actually asking the question whether the atrocities against religious minorities in Iraq amount to genocide. So I sent him my paper and sent some recommendations what can be done as well. And this is very much how our cooperation started uh, with research on, on the situation of the Yazidis, Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq. And this research was then used by Fiona Bruce MP, who tabled also an early day motion um, asking the UK government to recognize the atrocities as genocide. And um, the topic was debated in the UK House of Commons in April 2016, and indeed it was recognized by parliamentarians as genocide. That was one of the first uh, parliamentary recognitions of the atrocities as genocide following from um, um, Lithuania and, and the US. But uh, just, just slightly earlier than that, um, a similar question was being asked by uh, parliamentarians or members of the European Parliament in, in Brussels. And initially, as they were looking um, at the atrocities, they said that, yes, they are very serious, but are we, are we allowed to engage on the topic of genocide? We are just politicians. What do we know? And initially, they, they were not willing to recognize the atrocities as genocide, saying that this is not for politicians um, to deal with the question. At a very similar time, Peter Omtzik MP, who is a Dutch parliamentarian, was doing some uh, research on the topic for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and was asked to compile um, 
some information, produce a report and recommendations um, whether the atrocities amount to genocide and what does it mean in terms of our obligations, including under the Genocide Convention in Article um, 1. And as he, he was working on this research and I was also inputting um, into the report, um, it, it became very clear that indeed the atrocities amount to genocide and, and should trigger the duty to prevent genocide in Article 1. And indeed, um, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, once they've seen the report and recommendations, they agreed that this is genocide. And this was the, the first regional um, institution to actually recognize the atrocities as genocide. And because of this recognition at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the um, European Parliament decided to look at the issue again, only a few, few, a few days after they actually said it's not for us to deal with the question, and recognize the atrocities as genocide as well. And, um, and then, of course, we had several other recognitions of the atrocities as genocide most recently, and we are talking about 2023, and that was in, um, in the UK. So nine years after the atrocities, um, a German parliament recognized the atrocities recently as well, um, although um, Germany definitely must be uh, commended for, for the incredible response, including resettling so many Yazidis, making them very welcome uh, in, in Germany and, and making sure they have some kind of future. Um, so there are examples of wonderful work, even though countries such as Germany did not recognize uh, the atrocities until recently. The UK, I think the situation is, is far from that, but we'll discuss it with, with Jim later on and what else can we do. Um, just, just wanted to, uh, I don't have much time, so I just wanted to uh, go through a number of other situations. And the second situation that I wanted to mention is of, of Uyghurs in China. And it was the second most recognized case of recent um, or contemporary um, cases of genocide in recent, in recent months. And we are talking about different kind of atrocities. We are talking about putting people in, um, in camps um, and stripping them of their religious um, identity, um, but also subjecting them to torture, inhuman degrading treatment, rape and sexual violence, forced sterilization, um, forced um, abortions, and many more. And the atrocities are um, happening in a country that many, many countries around the world have wonderful co uh, um, cooperation with, with, with China, trade deals, and so on. And not many countries are willing to actually criticize China for, for what they are doing to the Uyghurs. Um, and because of that also, in terms of responses, there, are, there is very, very, very little that can be done, although we are still trying to um, at least ensure that there is a resolution at the UN, at the UN General Assembly, that establishes, establishes a mechanism to collect and preserve the evidence of the atrocities for when, maybe someday, not in five years, maybe not in 10 years, but maybe in 20, 30 years, when the situation in China changes, it will be possible to use this evidence and ensure some kind of justice and accountability for victims and survivors. I got a message to stop, but I've been told that I still have a tiny bit of time before the volunteer comes here and tackles me. So um, I will just, yeah, so just, 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 just a few very um, important uh, comments as, um, as well. At the very beginning, I mentioned that there are a few situations where we see the very clear element of religious persecution, religiously motivated genocide, but there are many other situations where we are talking about ethnic um, ethnically motivated um, atrocities, but nonetheless with the religious elements uh, to them. And some of the examples could be also uh, the situation in Ukraine. And there's been uh, very important research done into <clears throat> the situation, looking into, for example, the involvement of religious leaders in spreading propaganda, or for example, transporting weapons. And indeed, the UK government sanctioned one of the religious uh, leaders uh, for this kind of involvement and imposed the Magnitsky sanctions, freezing, uh, freezing, um, imposing freezing bans and travel um, travel bans, uh, freezing orders and travel bans um, um, against that uh, that individual. And a number of other countries follow um, follow follow through as well. 
And uh, another example will be, for example, of Tigray uh, in Ethiopia. We, we know about the horrific atrocities being perpetrated there, but um, very little is known about, for example, killing of religious leaders uh, in Tigray or attacking uh, pl places of worship uh, and so on. And the same is in relation to the situation in Darfur right now. Unfortunately, we are hearing very little information about those situations, and uh, there is very little political will to engage on those topics. Comparing the, the different responses to those um, atrocities, whether Iraq and, and the situation of, of the Yazidis, Uyghurs in, in China, um, we can talk about Rohingyas in Myanmar, um, we definitely have seen more um, engagement uh, in response to the situation in Ukraine because, of course, of, of proximity, um, but also more responses to the situation in China than, for example, in relation to the situation in Myanmar um, or Iraq. And this is something that needs to, needs to change. We need to make sure that we have um, approaches um, to atrocity prevention and, um, and legal responses uh, or legal uh, responses to the atrocities that are similar in relation to all the atrocities. It should not be a matter of of, um, of chance, uh, what kind of responses are implemented. We need better, better strategies um, to respond to atrocity crimes, no matter where they're being perpetrated. We have a wonderful example right now in Ukraine, um, whether in terms of legal responses, what can be done in response to atrocity crimes. So this is something that we need to implement um, around the world and in response to all atrocities. And I see the volunteer is already um, walking towards me, so I will stop here. And if there are any questions, I'm very happy to, uh, to respond um, uh, to them all and, and happy to chat afterwards as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. This one. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. And thank you to my the the, the experts that speak before me, uh, the, your presentations were really inspiring. I'm taking this to an, another level. Uh, this is a, a session about Western Europe. You can't go more west than in Europe than Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking to the local level because I think it's where everything starts. So just uh, a little framework about uh, Portugal, uh, a Catholic sa state since, since its foundation um, until the First Republic. Uh, but then we had a military um, coup with a, a fascist regime in 1926 until um, 1974 that proclaimed the Catholic Church as the traditional Portuguese state religion. That's why uh, in Portugal there are uh, Ninety percent of the population are Catholics. Um, the, in 1974, the military rebellion uh, with the people's support restored the Democratic Republic, and then with the, the 1976 Constitution uh, stated that freedom of conscience, religion, and worship is inviolable, and no one may be persecuted, deprived of their rights, or exempt from civic obligation or duties because of their religious beliefs or practices. In 2001, Portugal approved the Religious Freedom Law uh, that states that freedom of conscience, religion, and worship is inviolable and granted to everyone according to the Constitution, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, applicable and applicable international law, and this law. The main highlights of this law is the principle of, of cooperation between the state and the religious communities, the principle of tolerance, and the religious participation rights, such as marriage, funeral, public celebrations or religious festivities, religious schooling for children, release from work and school to celebrate the main holy dates of 
one's religion, conscientious objections, tax benefits to religious communities, and the creation of the Religious Freedom Commission, which is a very important commission in, in Portugal. Uh, now I'm taking this to the local level. You may be thinking we talked about international um, laws and uh, international treaties and the international framework. Why local? Uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt stated, human rights start in the smallest places, close to home. So uh, we try to uh, make re religious freedom work in my city, Odivelas, every day. It's located in the Lisbon region, Metropo Lisbon metropolitan region. It's very small town, 27 um, square kilometers, almost 150 inhabitants and 12% foreign citizens. So I'll just let you watch, uh, watch a video about the, the uh, religious diversity in my city. O município de Odivelas é um dos conselhos com maior diversidade cultural e religiosa em Portugal. Aqui coexistem diferentes formas de ver o mundo, de viver a fé e a espiritualidade. Odivelas é um município acolhedor com diversas comunidades que aqui encontram espaço para conviver com respeito, liberdade e, sobretudo, cidadania. Hoje vamos conhecer um pouco dessa pluralidade cultural. O cristianismo católico é a mais antiga confissão no município. Odivelas possui seis centros paroquiais. Cada pessoa, cada família vem com a, com a sua experiência, com a sua experiência de fé e é uma riqueza para todos. A Igreja do Nosso Senhor Jesus Cristo no Mundo é originária de Angola e está na região de Lisboa desde 1990. Que os valores quais são o respeito à vida, o amor ao próximo, a fraternidade, estamos abertos para o diálogo interreligioso, porque o ecumenismo é isto. É estarmos juntos de diferentes culturas, mas partilhar algo em comum que é Olivelas. A comunidade islâmica de Olivelas é hoje uma das maiores do país e compreende cerca de 7% do total de muçulmanos em Portugal. A mesquita é uma espécie de um ponto de encontro. Nós não temos bairros só de uma etnia, e isto é muito bom. Essa integração tem sido feita e nós queremos que continue. O movimento religioso da Igreja Batista existe em Portugal há mais de um século. Tem existido muito respeito à, à pluralidade entre as várias denominações que existem em Odivelas. Pela primeira vez liderada por uma voz feminina, a Assembleia de Deus de Odivelas representa os novos movimentos do protestantismo. E Odivelas é o um mundo, né? é o um mundo que está cá. Todas as pessoas são amadas por Deus. E esse é o nosso, esse é o nosso alvo, é o amor às pessoas. O Templo Sikh de Odivelas é o mais antigo do país. Em Portugal há entre 25 mil e 30 mil Sikhs. Nós vivemos um mundo que é multiculturas, multireligioso. Quando mais percebemos de um para o outro, mais portas vão abrir da comunidade. O tempo de candomblé é uma expressão da história afro-luso-ameríndia. O preconceito não é a religião. Cada um tem sua cultura. Se cada um respeitar a cultura do outro, hoje começam a viver bem e ter um bom diálogo. Os espaços religiosos mostram-nos o convívio entre as variadas tradições e o desafio da globalização. Existem muitas outras comunidades religiosas no município. Atualmente, mais de 2% da população de Odivelas é composta por estrangeiros das mais diversas nacionalidades. Para construir uma sociedade mais inclusiva, é necessário fomentar o diálogo interreligioso. 
A Oração pela Paz é um projeto anual da autarquia que busca celebrar a diversidade religiosa e cultural do município de Odivelas, onde a tradição e o progresso se encontram. To, to hear from them than, than for me, the, the um, various communities. Odivelas is an educating city. We are, um, we are a member of the International Association of Educating Cities, and the charter of the Educating Cities states that educating cities embrace the goal of inclusion, welcoming each person as they are, and inviting them to engage in a shared citywide project. Education based on values and human rights is more pressing, pressing than ever before, and it gives meaning, provides encouragement, and draws up a democratic roadmap. So as an educating city, Odivelas is committed to public policies that promote respect for human rights, social inclusion, dialogue and peace. Because, uh, because the law is meaningless if we don't take it locally in everyday life. Uh, I just have two minutes, so um, I want to present it's important um, the partnership between Lusofono University and Odivelas Municipality, sponsored by the I Commission for Migrations and co financed by the Asylum Migration Integration Fund. We um, built the religion charts of Odivelas. The religion chart of Odivelas is a project with a high degree of innovation in the elaboration of a systematization of a vast reality and the methodology and the approach to these realities. Its main goals are the identification of places of worship and groups of believers, their social motivation, their integration levels of education and expectation regarding the country as a whole, the characterizations of communities, religious facilities and geographic distribution, and the survey characterization and analysis of the social and educational support work. Um, by the different religious communities. We have, it's, uh, it's going on right now, um, annually, the Interfaith Harmony and Intercultural Dialogue Week. It's an opportunity for religious and cultural dissemination and sharing traditions and gast gastronomy for us. Portuguese food is everything, is very important, gathering people at the table. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's easier to make them uh, dialogue. And we have uh, a joint prayer for peace. At the end of this event, every community comes together. We get uh, people, um, citizens' uh, homes this, um, you can see this prayer. Everyone is comfortable with the same prayer. The, the firemen ring the, the sirens and everybody prays the same prayer. I think it, this is uh, really, really important for gathering communities. We have other initiatives like the Migrants, the Migrants Municipal Council, the Informal advisor, Advisory Board of Relig Religious Leaders with month, monthly gatherings. The, our religious leaders already have a WhatsApp group they communicate with. Uh, we uh, uh, have official representation at the main religious events. We include religious communities at this municipal social support network. Um, and we contribute to the social support work of uh, religious communities. I can just, as an example, the, um, the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints in Odivelas is helping us support the homeless people. Uh, we have multicultural events in school because we believe in education, as, uh, as we, you've seen. And uh, we have an uh, initiative, um, uh, school meals that respect religious principles. For example, we have halal meals uh, in schools for Muslims, vegetarian meals for Sikhs and Hindus. But we have red lines too, uh, too and we are uh, very committed to prevent female genital mutilation, which is a uh, problem, we are working with activists, we are, um, we, we are uh, um, working with religious Muslim leaders from Africa to um, state that this is uh, a violation of the human rights, the international law, the national law, and uh, it, it's against Koran also. So uh, we believe that our diversity is a strength and we are um, committed to promote initiatives that create the right environment for the gathering of different religious communities, uh, local di diplomacy that promotes the building of bridges and knowledge, empowering, empowering citizens to cultivate mutual respect and cooperation. 
We believe that at the local level, we can build peace and long-lasting protection for human rights. Thank you for your time. I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists for their fabulous presentations. Within our faith tradition, uh, my faith tradition, there is a particular doctrine that talks about mourning with those that mourn, comforting those who stand in need of comfort, and standing as a witness at all times and in all places and in all things. And it, that resonated <laughs> as we spoke about these things on... Anyway, I, 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 I'd leave that just for you to think about. We don't have much time. What I would like to do is just throw out a couple of ideas, and then if we can start with Julie, just come down and maybe like a minute and a half, whether it's a response to these questions or whether it's just based on what we've heard today, what you would like to share with us in these closing seconds. Um, first of all, um, we often talk about the big picture where the rubber meets the road, as we've just heard, is often at the local level. How does that local governmental entity or structure, that, that local one, perhaps set the standard for the nation and the globe, and perhaps even sometimes overcome or try to improve what's happening on the state level or on the uh, government level? So just a thought about the local and, and how things can uh, be helped on the local level. And the second thing, maybe just to think about, and if you have any ideas, and what about our young people? Anyone here under the age of, well, I won't even, I won't go down that road. <laughs> but how, if we're talking about the future, how do we have them mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort and stand as a witness? Julie, and again, any other things you might want to in a minute and a half share with us. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question, and thanks for that. I think the thing that I'm blessed at with um, working on an APPG is you get to work with government, and then you get to work with NGOs. And I work with the likes of people like Susanna, um, where we have evidence, and we're able to work at grassroots level to see what's really going on in the ground. And, and then you have the likes of working with Evelina that gives you the research just like she's spoken about. So it's coming and seeing how you can bridge those together to give the evidence that you need for MPs, but how MPs can then work for the benefit on grassroots level. And how do you do that with the youth? You work with the NGOs to be able to get them, especially in faith organisations, to um, teach the young ones growing up what they need to know now because they are the leaders of tomorrow. And so that's the way to go about it. Try and, try and get... And it goes back to what Susanna said. It starts in the family. Um, what's that saying? Uh, no other sudden su success can compensate for failure in the home. So that's where it starts. And it goes from family to, to youth leaders, because they are our leaders tomorrow. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Actually, as, as I heard these the very moving speeches, uh, the brother and sister from Pakistan, the work in the local community, I, I got the same idea like you did in the beginning, Jeff, uh, about the family. Uh, actually, I, I joked about it that we were uh, we are attacked as a Christian Muslim couple. A couple of people are saying you can't stand for all the religions, you know, you have to be on one side. And it's a, a scandal if you are a mixed pair uh, and, and have three kids together. And... Uh, I know I'm beginning to realize because people are looking at religions not from a theological level, they are looking at them from a practical level. And when they see people living together in the community, uh, in the family, uh, then they realize that they understand it. When I'm in a school and I'm talking about anti-Semitism, uh, the, the second or third question of the pupils is always about marriage. Uh, they, 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 grew, they grow up in a society where, they, where there's var variety and they want to know if they can love whom they will love or if there are barriers. And they're rather, I would say, pragmatic or realistic about the challenge.